Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to another installment of Happy Hour. Friday Happy Hour, I should say, on the Nudgecast. Mac Gamble, what is going on? Not too much. This is at our new time, by the way. So we may, we may need to change the title of this because we are recording these far earlier in the morning than we did previously, <laughs> which Happy Hour may be an inappropriate title. It would at least be inappropriate for us to be drinking during this. <laughs> yeah. I guess you would have maybe Bloody Marys. Maybe we could call it like brunch, something like that. Mm-hmm. Friday coffee. Friday coffee. Yeah, that seems way more professional too. It, it probably does. Maybe we should have considered that when we, we were considered it. kicking around names. Anyway, we still own Friday, damn it. So tune in on Friday for these. It. Um, it will still do the uh, the Instagram the, the Instagram ring um at some point as well uh look out for max instagram is the best instagram we have to follow so that's m-a-c underscore gambill g-a-m-b-i-l-l don't, don't forget the underscore his name the underscore. <laughs> intentional <laughs> um, so All yeah right. so i guess we'll do that after the recording now is what the plan is yeah yeah i mean you guys out there obviously have no idea when we're recording this so just, you know, I think maybe around 10, we'll, we'll aim for that. Uh, this is me trying to make sure I'm on the right page. So, okay. okay. Yeah, so that, I will fair. put out a story. I'll let people know when we're going to go live and then we will go live. I mean, really, we do this for us anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> just, just an excuse for us to put a microphone in front of us. <laughs> That's right. Love to hear myself talk. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, today, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, program planning. Um I dare you to plan the perfect program. That's that's basically what I'm thinking today is is one of the biggest things that, you know, we obsess over is trying to really honestly it's built into our mission is trying to perfect program delivery uh for coaches. So um I suppose that would be a waste of time if we didn't also talk about how to plan a really effective program to deliver um via apps or online. So let's dig in. Let's do it. I think this is, you just wrote a really nice email about this the other day. So this is kind of top of mind. And I think it sounds like you've got things you can jump into pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it, if only the world always made as much sense as there to be like an email, that's sort of a template for these, these podcasts, that would be great. Um, (laughs) That would make life a little easier for sure. But yeah. So the email that went out, um, Actually, we were trying to figure this out because we've been sending out a, little, a few more emails than usual early this year. Welcome to 2021, by the way, everybody. Um, seems to be more of the same so far, but hopefully we can get this thing back. Spillover from 2020. <laughs> That's just the spillover. I think we're I, I think we're going to hit our stride going into the last week of January is what I'm predicting. Uh, it's a bold uh, prediction, um, maybe even a hot take, but we'll hope it, it comes to fruition. Um, but anyway, yeah, email went out, I think, on Tuesday this week, um, really digging into um, in preparation for the Program Builder Mastermind that's coming up in February. Um, some of the things that I've been digging into and thinking about in terms of, you know, training for um, exercises you can do to build out a better and design a better program, dare I say, a bulletproof program, um, obviously, no program is going to be perfectly bulletproof mm-hmm. for engaging everybody, but that's always, you know, set that goal out there and, and keep striving for it. Um, since we're all thinking about government things uh, this week in particular, I'd compare that idea to, you know, saying the goal is a more perfect union, build a more perfect program. So let's, let's put some big goals out there. Um, all right. So I, I ran down three exercises uh, in that email uh, to that end. And the whole idea was to give people the hardest thing to do when honestly planning anything, but definitely for, for coaches who aren't always, I would say like natural creators, um, in terms of, you know, designing new things. Um, some are really great at it, but you know, it's, it's not natural to everybody. So it's good to have kind of specific, templates or exercises in front of you to help you get started. Cause that's the hardest thing to do is actually just start the process. And I find that the easiest thing to tell a coach who's working on actually formulating what their program should be laid out. Like is to write, write it off the top of your head in the form of a story of your ideal client going through the program successfully and having a great experience. 
Um, and I one like to do that because the hardest thing to do for a coach is to start this process and writing that narrative is super easy, right? You probably, even if you don't really totally know what your program is yet, you can absolutely tell a good story of this ideal person you envision yourself working with, how you want to transform their lives and how they get from the start to that transformation. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really, it's important to write this in narrative form because there's a purpose behind this. Um, and the first purpose it, is that it's easy to, to write that out and, and an easy way to get started. But the second is maybe even more important, which is that it's actually a really valuable exercise in terms of laying out your program in a way that makes sense because stories naturally make sense to people. Um, I can't remember who it is. I think it was Donald Miller says, talks about stories as like a natural sense-making mechanism mm-hmm. for humans. Um, and it's absolutely true. You can think you can make anything make sense if you put it in a story format. That's why like um, myths throughout history are so restated and valuable. And, you know, um, I don't know. There's so many examples, uh, so many examples. That it's hard to come up with, but um, it's a really valuable place to start. I think, you know, I always, always like to start there. Yeah, I, I think. Frequently, when I, I look at a lot of the programming of our partners as we kind of go through implementation, I think you can typically tell, you know, most people have in their education or credentialing have been given some type of, you know, baseline training around probably program creation. But I think to your point, sometimes when, when that, you know, people pursue that exercise, it doesn't always resonate or come really, you know, ring true, I think, to the client who's going through it. And I think the other thing to sometimes consider is especially with remote programming is making sure there's consistent value. So on paper, it may seem like you're checking a lot of the right boxes in terms of maybe, you know, helping a person get from A to B, but as you're thinking about kind of your overall client experience, I think sometimes what I, what I see is people will sometimes look at it, especially when they're thinking about like how um, communication may weave into it. I kind of lump that into it too. Um, you know, doing things that maybe are more kind of consistent with what you'd see in like creating an email workflow or an email sequence. And there's maybe spacing things out almost too much. You know, if you think about if you ever sign up for a service, typically the way you see it is you get more frequent emails at first and then they kind of stretch out over time. Um, While some of that may apply, what I tend to see is there's sometimes value gaps in programming, meaning that uh, when a person first signs up, maybe there's a lot that's happening in the first few weeks and then ultimately it kind of spaces out. But I think if you have someone signing up for a multi-month program, it's something that you do need to be conscious about and just thinking about those value gaps and making sure you are providing consistent value. So I think that gets back to exactly what you said is taking a step back and making sure there is a real journey or a story or a narrative to it that if you put yourself in the shoes of the client, it's something that feels natural and doesn't feel you know, either fragmented or feel, um, you know, sometimes I think there's just some ambiguity to, to online programming that, that maybe doesn't uh, stick out to the coach when they're first putting it down on paper. But if you really kind of try to map it out, hey, what I, if I had a client I'm going through this and say this is week one or week two or whatever week it is, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? And I think that kind of circles back to some of that podcast we do um, a few weeks ago regarding kind of think connecting with clients at kind of a different level. I think it's really understanding and kind of empathizing with where they are, but um, mm-hmm. just see value gaps or and, and something I tend to see in a lot of the programming we work on. Yeah. And forcing yourself to sit down and I'm, I'm actually saying is this exercise would be to sit down and write this story, put it on mm-hmm. pen to paper for this. Um, it's the best way to do it. Um, another thing, you know, you, you talked about value gaps which is a really good point. Um, but what you'll typically find that will come out of this for you is kind of naturally, as you write and tell the story, you'll sort of find little points in the story where either, you know, the client has basically little aha moments along the way or milestones that are hit along the way. And the second step of, of this exercise is to literally pick through and try to highlight a couple of aha moments or milestones Mm -hmm. along the way. And those becomes sort of 
begin begin to form. It's often the first step also and best first step for forming kind of like the bullet points, the value points of your program so that you can frame those really nicely. For example, on a website to present to clients to help them buy better. Because one of the things that I've noticed, especially recently, is that a lot of coaching businesses have a really hard time framing concisely and packaging the value of their program. And this is a good first exercise to get uh, a step further on that road too. Yeah, you you are spot on with that one. I think that is probably one of the pain points I see, or maybe one of the common pitfalls I see in a lot of the partners we work with is, in the, I think it's just the nature of what I think online coaching and programming is, you know, I think in some cases it can be a little bit ambiguous and it can be a little bit um, undefined. And obviously in any kind of service-based offering, there is a little bit of just doing what, what you can to help your client. Um, but yeah, I think the, this exercise can be tremendous in helping because the better you, the more, you, the better you can articulate this, the more it is going to help you from a marketing perspective, getting on your website. I think it'll help you from closing new prospects. Um, it, you'd be surprised how many people I have conversations with that when we first get started, their online offering is a little more than just, Hey, we're connected. I'll text you occasionally and I'm kind of monitoring your data and there's not any kind of real framework or structure to it. And I think it's really important to remember that uh, your client can usually feel that. And they, you know, it's something that, that, that kind of awkwardness or that flexibility or that kind of uncertainty, it's something they'll start feeling too on their end. And I think it, it's harder to keep a person engaged for a longer period of time on something like that. Yeah. And this, that tackling that step without a good kind of exercise to get it started um, really hard for a lot of coaches, especially who are really passionate about personalizing the, you know, the coaching mm-hmm. program, right. The experience for the client, um, just because, you know, your, your sort of built in bias is like, well, no, it's not one size fits all. I'm personalizing this at every step. Like I'm, I'm doing that along the way. Well, mm-hmm. yes, but that's not how you sell it is, is just basically what we're saying here. Yeah. So as, I guess as we're talking about client stories, because I do, you know, I, I remember one of the first times I encountered something like this was Jack Dorsey from Twitter um, Square years ago, talked about this, I think on a podcast that he, this was something he did for his company. I think a lot of companies, startups do things like this. Um, are there any resources you've encountered that you think would be helpful for anybody listening? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know what? Let's let's get to that after I guess the the next couple of of points because I think I could refer to at least one anyway mm-hmm. um, off the top of my head. I should have come prepared with that though. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I think in general though, and there's I think a lot of different ways to go about it. But ultimately, even if you were just I think at the basics, thinking about what what a client is thinking and feeling each week of their program, like I've. I know I've worked on some implementations over the past couple of years. I can think of a couple where um, they typically were around very strict nutritional protocols in terms of um, having people make pretty significant changes. And I remember they typically could tell me certain days people were feeling certain things and they'd say, Hey, it's on day three that you really start feeling, you start feeling like this or start feeling like that. And that's when you may start having, hesitations or reservations or, or anxiety. And so what, what's important about that is then you can start crafting messaging and having content ready to kind of address that. So I think the more you can kind of break it out, like I said, per week, or in that case, it, the, um, some of those programs I was referencing were shorter kind of multi-day programming, but that I do think even just thinking about it, that high level is going to, Hey, what is a person thinking or feeling each week is going to help you. That's like the best marketing advice I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> what is a person thinking and feeling now? Go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Empathy, my friends. Empathy. Empathy. There we go. Um, all right. So that's a great place to start. Um, and, and in many ways, the second exercise I have is very similar um, and also kind of equally maybe feel obvious, um, but there's some purpose behind it as well. And that is to actually do this a similar it's a similar idea for sure, but you start at the end and work your way back to the beginning. So this is, I just called this working backwards in the email that that went out earlier this week, but um, starting from basically the goal or the outcome that you envision your, your ideal clients wanting to have. 
Um, they get there and then working backwards to the beginning from the goal uh, in order to kind of map the story in the other direction. The reason is that looking at things from this second perspective often gives you another opportunity to fill in some of those value gaps or realize some of those value gaps that you didn't catch the first time through. Um, it's incredibly, you'll find it's a little bit easier often to identify the milestones in a specific way um, when you start at the end and work back to the beginning um, and really envision kind of what you need to unlock at each each point. So while you'll get maybe a couple of milestones that really kind of hit right and, and feel right in the narrative form, mm -hmm. what you're really doing there is putting things in the right order. Um, working backwards, you're really finding kind of, oh, in order to get there, I need to unlock this first. And in order to get yep. there, I need to unlock this first. You'll get a lot better and cleaner probably at those milestones. So that would be the hope from working backwards. Yeah, and I think that aligns really nicely with some of what we're just talking about in terms of like communication strategy, because I think if you know you, you have, you know, certain milestones along the way of the journey, like I said, you can then def kind of, it gives you a bit of a, a map to understand which touch points need to occur when, and then mm -hmm. you can really get to a point you have a really nice kind of journey mapped out entirely where you know, hey, this based on the fact we want to get people to these milestones at certain times, here's some of the messaging I need, here's some of the content pieces. Maybe even if there is some kind of accountability tracking that you're following too, hey, these are the items that are going to be tracked at certain times throughout the journey. So I really do think working backwards, kind of that idea meshes well with the whole customer journey. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and it helps like you'll find, you know, you find these milestones and so you ask, okay, okay, how do I get them to that milestone? And you'll start identifying right the the content resources you may want to share, and also flagging points where you may want to be ready with specific kind of uh, focuses for your for your actual direct communication with those clients, like you said. Um, but also, you're sort of you know scaffolding to build people up to those milestones. So um, I'd plan to kind of double down on all of those mm -hmm. kind of steps, right? Like to give you like usually you have to say something more than once to get someone fully to buy in and say, aha, I got it, or get to the point where they're behaving in a way where they're hitting those milestones, right? So um, gives you a chance to identify those really key ones. And I would really focus on the big ones so that you can spend enough time um, or lay out enough time and effort um, into your program to properly kind of reinforce getting people mm -hmm. to that point for sure. Yeah, we talked about this with Laura Pobrin, um, I guess a few weeks ago. Did that episode go live, by the way? Did we ever push that one? It's going live next week. Oh, yeah. nice. Okay, so it's very timely. Um, did, didn't mean to actually give her the shout out like that, but there you go. I'm excited to get that one out. But that was one thing, because I, I really, really enjoyed that episode. Um, I thought there was something from that episode that was really important too, which was that idea of, you, you know, this sounds obvious, but really kind of connecting with your clients, understanding where they are. And where we can think about these frameworks. And I, I love this idea of actually crafting the customer journey or the client journey with the idea of working backwards. There is some, you know, so you've got this framework or this kind of, you know, this um, kind of roadmap. It's, we talked a little bit about kind of an 80, 20 rule almost where you have kind of 80% of that kind of structure where, you know, Hey, when a person signs up for you, this is what they're getting. But the other kind of 20% is that, the the fluid, the flexible, connecting with your client, how they need to be connected with having the conversations when they need it, where they need it. Um, and I think it it is that fine balance because I've, you know, we've talked about this. If you go in with zero structure framework for one, you're not going to be able to articulate what you're actually offering people and, and your clients will have no clue what they're signing up for. Um, but on the flip side of that, if you have too rigid a structure where it almost feels robotic, I think you're also losing something and it, you may not be connecting with your clients properly, may not be really building the rapport on the front end, getting them bought in. So it, it is that kind of balancing act and exactly what the percentage is. It's probably somewhere around 80, 20, because I feel like the world revol revolves around that ratio, but um, something that's just so important is kind of keeping that in mind. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a, you'll find it's a furious balance for sure. Um, and yeah, if you if you skimp on the connection part, then none of the none of the rest matters, right? Because if the client isn't engaged and bought in and trusting you, then they're gonna fade away long before mm -hmm. your program comes to fruition. 
Yeah, because if you're just if you're just pumping robotic content out at people, in some in your client has something going on in their life that just really maybe it just requires one simple thirty minute conversation with them to just show that you care and that you understand and you're listening. You're kind of helping navigate around whatever's going on. That that one conversation could maybe get them back on track. Versus if you're just kind of continuing to pump them out robotic content, even though it's very appropriate to the program they're in it, you, you may just be kind of missing the mark based on where that person now is versus where they were when they first signed up. So that's kind of that, that fluid part of the program needs that needs to be there. Yeah. The lasting engagement comes from that, like built up store of trust, right. Yep. in the relationship, not from, you know, the content hitting the, What's, if a robot can do what you're doing, you probably need to make an adjustment. Well, this kind of gets to, I know you had this stat weeks ago, we were talking about how the shortfall of online courses and how online courses um, across, you know, across maybe all course creators, I think we, we saw kind of the, the dark secret of online courses was that completion rates were as low as 15%. And it's, which I, I don't think I made that number up, right? I think you had actually- That was the was, high end. That was the high end. It was like five to 15%, <laughs> something like that, which it's funny. I don't know if anyone listening to this can, can relate, but like I have absolutely purchased courses before on like Udemy and with like perfect intention to listen to them. And I've, I've started some before, like I completely fall into that and maybe it's, I got what I needed to out of it. Mm -hmm. But I just think that really aligns with that idea that, you know, when I first signed up, I had something going on that prompted me to take that action and sign up for it. But without that human connection and without having someone kind of walk me through certain pieces, maybe there was content that came up that I didn't wrap my head around or whatever it would be that I think, that that rigid nature of a course um, can actually, I think, turn people off in some ways, if if not kind of woven into the right model. Definitely, I mean, I, this is getting back to kind of basic human needs, but I think the yeah. the the shortfall of an online course is that there's no connection there, and mm -hmm. we all need some type of connection. And that's why I think running a successful coaching business is so much more fulfilling than just pumping out you know online courses, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also, you know, why your program can be incredibly effective if you find that balance, right? Um, okay, ready to move on to the third the exercise third, let's, here? Let's jump into it. What's, let's, what's let's the third one? Let's dig into it. So this, one's, this one is, is, I would say, um, probably if there is kind of a secret and a best trick to start to kind of bulletproof your program a little mm -hmm. bit, this is where I would say it starts. And this concept is sort of a mental model that, you know, a bunch of famous people throughout history used from like ancient Stoics planning out, kind of making sure they always had a plan for the unexpected. Mm -hmm. I know like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca both have writings on this and all the way to like Warren Buffett's right hand man, uh, Charlie Munger uses this concept all the time mm -hmm. um, and talks about it in his books as well. And um the idea, the concept is called inversion. And the whole concept is basically, all right, it's sort of like the opposite of doing the ideal client story. In, in inversion, you want to kind of flip it upside down and say, okay, now imagine your client signed up and totally failed yeah. to hit their goals. Um, write, you know, write down or tell yourself the story of what went wrong and why. Mm -hmm. And what this is going to allow you to do is start to plan for some of the weak points, the threats and the pitfalls that are baked into this program process that you're taking people through. Um, and this is where it really starts to get interesting in terms of um, really laying out the key pieces that are going to take your program from like, okay, everybody's pumping out programs. They all have this ideal vision of mm -hmm. where they're going to, you know, actually getting way more people to the finish line, even just based on the plan you have in place. I think that the obvious place, this really makes a lot of sense. And, you know, we, we, I know marketers see it from like um, optimization with like, e you know, email workflows um, is if you, you have a structure or framework together and you know, Hey, this person started going off the rails in week, you know, say week five or week six, whatever it was. Well, you may find that there's some kind of value gaps, as we talked about earlier, where, you know, you need to refine some of the content you were sharing. So if we kind of, if we circle back on that idea, if you are just doing a fully flexible program where there's really no structure or framework, 
it's really difficult to analyze kind of in doing a postmortem or whatnot that if, if you do have these pieces in plan, you know where the milestones are in the content and the touch points that you're kind of delivering in certain times, you can really go back and start saying, okay, well, I need to refine or enhance or change some of the content here, or maybe I need to do a, start weaving in a new client call here. Um, you know, really help fill in those gaps or, or make changes, you know, so that's where that structure and that framework really makes a lot of sense. That is such a good point. I, I feel like this is a really good exercise for identifying when you may want to have some of those synchronous sessions or actually make connections, get in front of people. Um, that's a great use of this. And, you know, just to make sure this is coming off in a specific and tangible way, um, you know, James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, um, he, he writes an example of this, like a specific example of, of this, um, a method for this in his book. And he talk, he calls it a failure pre-mortem mm. is what he calls the exercise. And you reminded me when you said post-mortem. Yeah. So the idea of a failure pre-mortem, failure pre-mortem. I like this because pre-mortem, yeah, Pre, pre-mortem. So before it goes wrong um, is that it, I kind of alluded to it, but you really, you sit down and you think, okay, someone signed up for your program and say it's a six month program. Now put yourself in the future six, six months later. Um, they have totally failed to reach their goals. Mm-hmm. Write out the story of how they failed to re- reach their goals to make it, make sure this is tangible because inversion, you can do it a lot of ways, but mm-hmm. I love how, how tangible this is like, I think, James Clear's core talent is making big concepts really specific and tangible. Mm-hmm. Um, I like how specific that is. It's a specific exercise you can do to get to those like points where there are some gaps that you need to fill in along the way. And I would, I would think anyone who's first getting into uh, more of like an online offering, which, you know, by the nature of what 2020 was, I think we, we are all kind of doing online stuff at this point. Um, it, it's something that you will naturally see at first. And I, I don't think you ever perfect it. I think it's something over time, you'll just continue to optimize. And like I said, using the example of like an email sequence, it's a great example. I know we probably refresh our email sequences every handful of months. And, you know, we've been doing this for years at this point. And there's just always, way, you know, thing trends evolve, society evolves, culture evolves. So you have to kind of keep up with it. So mm-hmm. you, you may find that, you know, there's new ways to touch your clients. There's new ways to reach them. There's new ways to connect with them. And I think that's where making sure you're kind of continuing to optimize, like you, you never have a perfect program, I think is something to really keep in mind. And it's something that you can always be um, optimizing, refining. And like I said, keep in mind that balance though of, of structure and framework with flexibility. That is so true. And, you know, you'll, make it significant adjustments, maybe even from time to time. So example in our lives right now, we're push, pushing out a major update to our coaching platform. Um, and that's a, I mean, in many ways, wiping the slate clean just with, you know, we can carry over the lessons from adjustments to our old workflow. But we are starting from scratch with a new one. So it starts a new iteration cycle. I think we're going to start way ahead of where we were before, but we will learn pretty quickly that we yeah. need to make adjustments and, and the cycle starts over. You know, it's funny. I mean, I, I think just to that point of kind of thinking about our evolution, you know, I think this is the fourth version of our platform, as I recall, um, maybe the fifth, some, somewhere in there. Somewhere Depends between, on where you want to draw the lines. That... Between zero and 10, somewhere yeah. in there. Um, and the reasoning for that is just how I think about how online coaching has evolved so much. I think about how we first started. So much of it was scrambling, trying to just centralize some of the communication because so many coaches were using text, email, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, you, you, know, you name it. I was probably seeing coaches message with it. And also too, trying to figure out how mobile health apps and devices kind of weave in. And so it was really around just communication and data. Now, I think what we've seen is an incredible shift towards more kind of automated content delivery and the idea of, you know, email sequencing is really, it's great for marketing. It's, you know, it's a very cold way to communicate with clients. So automated emails probably aren't the solution. And then I think we've seen the same thing with learning management systems where, you know, great for some things, but also too, a very cold way to kind of engage your clients. So I think we're just, you know, nudge in its own right is kind of following these trends as well. And this evolution with can think about online coaching five years ago to where it is right now. I mean, completely different game, far more mature models, more mature solutions. Um, 
you know, now, now coaches, I think are having to compete with some of the user experiences, as we discussed with companies like Peloton, Apple, mm-hmm. that have just kind of raised the bar. So I think as a result, consumers are getting such better experiences across the board, but it does mean coaching has to kind of keep up with this and make sure it's not something that's going to be left behind by the consumer companies. Absolutely. Right. God, that's such a good point. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, some of the lessons that we can can carry over uh, just to kind of throw out a couple of high level sort of principles um, that I think we're carrying into this uh, kind of new iteration of the way we're communicating things that I think is very helpful. I think high level, one of the things that is very hard for coaches who are inherently experts mm-hmm. at whatever they're coaching is to translate their expertise. You're really smart. You have a way that you understand things that's way beyond your clients. Yep. How do you translate that into the beginner's mind, like a total novice's mind and start speaking that language? Because you need to find a way to do that. It's incredibly I would actually difficult. argue that's probably one of the biggest pitfalls in engagement we see is mm-hmm. the scenarios and situations in which I'll sometimes look at the types of communication some of our partners use with, with their clients. And we've talked about this before. Sometimes it's, um, you know, thousand word messages too clinical in some cases. And that's really not the best way to engage a person remotely. I think what we see is I always used to say the rule of a tweet, which I guess is no longer appropriate because I think Twitter, you can actually write really long tweets now. But um, the point was that, you know, thinking about how you would text a friend or a family member and I, I completely agree. I think a, someone who has that level of intelligence, whether you're a health coach, a sales coach, a life coach, whatever you are, to be able to kind of you know, bring it back down and connect with your client in a very kind of friend-to-friend manner and communicate very much you know, plain text, is an, I think that is, um, that's a skill set and that takes time. And that's something I think sometimes the newer coaches we work with struggle with is they have great training. They're incredibly educated, but sometimes they have a harder time, I would argue, at first in engaging their clients remotely because I think what you're naturally taught doesn't always translate perfectly into more of the online remote types of engagement. Just my two cents and an observation, like I said, my two cents. Yeah. I hope you uh, wrote that one down because that's <laughs> so critical. Um You know, one of the things that I think we've learned or gotten better at recently that is probably just to make the idea of getting into that like new person, novice mindset. Um, One of the ideas that we've latched onto lately that I think is something that you can actually put into action after listening to this is identifying some kind of anchors that are really familiar to people for some of the concepts that you're teaching. Yep. um, Or coaching people on. And, um, you know, for us, you know, we're rolling out this system with new, even p- core pieces of the system. So like we have a concept called cards, which are each a touch point in a program. How do we explain cards? Because they're in a mobile app and they're totally different from anything before, right? Well, no, what, what purpose are they solving? A similar one from how you're probably emailing your clients right now. Um, you have sort of content and resources that you share probably via email. Mac just mentioned how it feels cold to do that. Probably you're probably further in the relationship than that mm-hmm. or should be. Um, cards are a way to do that baked right into your app so that, you know, everything is in there nice and clean. You get notification when you get a new one, uh, you can tap right in and it's super interactive, unlike an email. So like an email, but better. So how is what you're teaching kind of mm-hmm. like something else maybe better or just like something else in that you can anchor it to that concept and help someone wrap their minds around exactly what it is before you kind of dig into the details. So true. So true. It, do we want to touch on the mastermind? Yeah, why not? So a lot of what we talked about today is definitely going to be stuff that I'm walking you through. If you do take advantage of the mastermind, which Our next uh, group is going to start right after the the product update goes out. So um, that should be the first week in February. Um, We'll be a little bit on our toes for that. I hope we don't have to push it back a week, Mm -hmm. but if we do, uh, we will. And that's going to be totally fine. But um, yeah, we're going to dig into uh, going into some of these exercises, uh, learning from some of our friends who are just 
amazing at, at different, <laughs> different concepts and better than us at, um, you know, Medina from uh, Jay Shetty, hopefully is going to get involved again. Uh, we had Stacy from growth tools last time talking about uh, power partnerships and getting in front of other people's audiences, all, all the good stuff mm-hmm. there. But the, the core goal this time is obviously pretty clear. We're going to help you build your program into your app. So you're basically mm-hmm. creating a second, you within the app to knock out some of the kind of everyday tasks so that you can really focus your time on building connections with your clients. Like you'll hear about with the next episode with Laura, Laura. Um, and, uh, yeah, really be able to be more efficient and effective and scale yourself. It's funny as you were talking about connections, I think one of the biggest pieces of feedback we got from the first cohort was how much I think they enjoyed the, the human connection with all of us. So between our team, but also too with the other coaches that were in it. So it's uh yeah, I think kind of a good group. And I think that that channels, you know, channels are growing and we're getting more and more people kind of, we can, I think a rising tide, we're all kind of learning from each other on the whole online coaching thing. That's right. Let's, let's build a community around this and we'll all learn together. Um, and that's actually one of the goals of this go around. So um, I'll leave that as a teaser because there's something specific that we're going to get into and kind of a bonus uh, bit of the mastermind this go around that's going to really let you take advantage of that, take advantage of other people and gather feedback a little bit better on the things you're putting together. But I think that's it. I think that's all we got for today. Mac, you have any, any wise last words? You shared a lot of wisdom today. Hey, I was on my A game. I had some coffee. I'm excited for the Instagram live. So I guess we'll, we'll jump on over to that here at some point. All right, let's do it. All right, guys. Um, if you haven't already subscribe on Apple podcasts on Spotify, check us out on YouTube. The YouTube channel is growing. Happy to see that we, you know, it hasn't been around that long. So um, really having some fun there. Um, do me a favor and subscribe. That's just fun to see every one of those messages come through. Makes my day every time. I think it shows to keep in mind, it shows that you appreciate what we're doing and that you, you know, you support the movement. And I think that's the main thing because we're doing this for everybody. So you're here. We're perfecting the way coaching programs are delivered. Hopefully we'll see how we do. We'll see coming out soon.